Today is day six for the Come Follow Me study for this week, December 11th through the 17th. Revelation 6 through 14. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb. Saturday, December 16th, 2023. Revelation 14. The Lamb shall stand upon Mount Zion. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said there are two Jerusalems and two Mount Zions. The old city and mount are in Canaan, the holy land of ancient times. The new city and mount are in America, the Zion and choice land of latter days. Mount Zion of old, adjacent to Jerusalem, was a sacred site in ancient Israel. And the new Mount Zion, which shall yet flourish on the American continent in heaven-born splendor, shall stand as a holy place in the worship of modern Israel. Our hope is centered not in the ashes of what once was, but in the majestic grandeur of what is to be. Our affirmation of hope is we believe that Zion will be built upon this, the American continent. What concerns us is the word of the Lord concerning his church, established in the last days for the restoration of his people, as he has spoken by the mouth of his prophets, and for the gathering of his saints to stand upon Mount Zion, which shall be the city of New Jerusalem. This word of revelation from the Almighty includes the fact that the New Jerusalem shall be built beginning at the temple lot, which is appointed by the finger of the Lord in the western boundaries of the state of Missouri, and dedicated by the hand of Joseph Smith, Jr., and others with whom the Lord was well pleased. Verily, this is the word of the Lord, that the city New Jerusalem shall be built by the gathering of the saints, beginning at this place, even the place of the temple. It is in this temple that the sons of Moses and of Aaron shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, upon Mount Zion in the Lord's house. Revelation 14.1 And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Elder Bruce and McConkie, referring to a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, said, Which Mount Zion? All of the references to Mount Zion, which talk of the second coming, and related Latter-day events appeared to have in mind the new Mount Zion in Jackson County, Missouri. Thus we read, Prepare you the way of the Lord, and make his path straight, for the hour of his coming is nigh, when the Lamb shall stand upon Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his Father's name written on their foreheads. Then comes this explanatory comment, which shows the Lord will appear in many places at his coming. For behold, he shall stand upon the Mount of Olivet, and upon the mighty ocean, even the great deep, and upon the isles of the sea, and upon the land of Zion. And then, using some language borrowed from Revelation 14.2, the revelation continues, And he shall utter his voice out of Zion, and he shall speak from Jerusalem, and his voice shall be heard among all people, and it shall be a voice as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, which shall break down the mountains, and the valleys shall not be found." It seems clear that the Lord and his exalted associates shall stand in glory upon the American Mount Zion, although it may well be that in his numerous other appearances, including that on the Mount of Olivet, which is itself but a few stones throw from old Mount Zion, he shall also be accompanied by the 144,000 high priests. For they follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Revelation 14.2 And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harps harping with their harps. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to the voice of many waters, said, The sound created by oceans of water, as he who created both earth and sea drives the great deep back into the north countries, and the islands shall become one land. Revelation 14.3 And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty-four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to a new song, said, A song of victory and triumph, a song hailing Christ's millennial reign, a song proclaiming that the kingdoms of this world are swept away, and that the true king of earth now dwells with men, a song of redemption and glory and honor, a song that cannot be sung until the promised day of peace and righteousness arrives. D&C 84, For I, the Almighty, have laid my hands upon the nations to scourge them for their wickedness, and plagues shall go forth, and they shall not be taken from the earth until I have completed my work, which shall be cut short in righteousness. Until all shall know me who remain, even from the least unto the greatest, 
and shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord, and shall see eye to eye, and shall lift up their voice, and with their voice together sing this new song, saying, The Lord hath brought again Zion, the Lord hath redeemed his people Israel, according to the election of grace, which was brought to pass by the faith and covenant of their fathers. The Lord hath redeemed his people, and Satan is bound, and time is no longer. The Lord hath gathered all things in one. The Lord hath brought down Zion from above. The Lord hath brought up Zion from beneath. The earth hath travailed and brought forth her strength, and truth is established in her bowels. And the heavens have smiled upon her, and she is clothed with the glory of her God, for he stands in the midst of his people. Glory and honor and power and might be ascribed to our God, for he is full of mercy, justice, grace, and truth and peace for ever and ever. Amen. Revelation 14.4 These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed, or purchased, or ransomed, from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to they are virgins, said they are pure and undefiled. Also, their not being defiled with women means they were not led astray from Christian faithfulness by the tempters who jointly constitute the spiritual harlot. Revelation 14.5 And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Elder Bruce McConkie said a perfect description of all exalted beings, for as with the 144,000, so with all of whom the glorified Lord says, Ye shall be even as I am. In contrast to the deceptions of Satan's widespread influence and power recorded in Revelation 13, chapter 14 offers hope. The opening verses in Revelation 14 describe a group who have the Father's name written in their foreheads. They are clean and chaste. Follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth, and are redeemed from among men, and they are honest and without fault before God. Through the prophet Joseph Smith, the Lord revealed that the 144,000 are high priests ordained unto the holy order of God to administer the everlasting gospel, for they are they who are ordained out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, by the angels to whom is given power over the nations of the earth to bring as many as will come to the church of the firstborn. The song that is sung by the 144,000 may be the same song that is recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 84, 98 through 102. Gospel Restored by Angelic Ministrants John saw three angels, each proclaiming a message to the earth's inhabitants. The first angel brought the everlasting gospel to the nations of the earth. Many Latter-day Prophets have taught that the angel represents Moroni. The angel may also represent a composite of the many heavenly messengers, including Moroni, who have assisted in the latter-day restoration of the gospel. Elder Bruce R. McConkie pointed out the angel Moroni brought the message, that is, the word, but other angels brought the keys and priesthood, the power. Revelation 14.6 And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. One fulfillment of the prophecy in these verses occurred when Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith and led him to the records that he translated and published as the Book of Mormon. This book contains the everlasting gospel that we are charged with preaching unto every nation and kindred and tongue and people. After reading Revelation 14.6 together, consider showing pictures of the angel Moroni and of other angels who helped restore the gospel in our day. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Now, as to the actual work of restoration, what angel performed this mighty deed, this work which involves the salvation of all men on earth in these latter days? Who restored the everlasting gospel? Was it one angel or many? It is traditional and true to reply Moroni, son of Mormon, the now resurrected Nephite prophet who holds the keys of the stick of Ephraim, the one through whose ministry the Book of Mormon was again brought to light. The reasoning is that the Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel, that therein in God's message of salvation for all of earth's inhabitants, and that this gospel message is now being taken by the Lord's witnesses to one nation and kindred and tongue and people after another. But other angels were yet to come. 
Moses, Elias, Elijah, Gabriel, Raphael, and diverse angels, all declaring their dispensation, their rights, their keys, their honors, their majesty and glory, and the power of their priesthood, giving line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Thus the angel Moroni brought the message, that is, the word, but other angels brought the keys and priesthood, the power, and in the final analysis, the fullness of the everlasting gospel consists of all the truths and powers needed to enable men to gain a fullness of salvation in the celestial heaven. In addition to bringing the everlasting gospel to the earth, the first angel announced that the hour of his judgment is come, a fitting message for a world that has been worshiping the beast. Revelation 14.7 saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. DNC 88 And angels shall fly through the mist of heaven, crying with a loud voice, sounding the trump of God, saying, Prepare ye, prepare ye, O ye inhabitants of the earth, for the judgment of our God is come. Behold and lo, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. This message prepares the reader for the second angel, whose message is that Babylon is fallen, which means that wickedness will end. Eternal torment awaits the wicked. Revelation 14.8 And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Babylon's sin is described as fornication, meaning that the wicked of the world have been unfaithful in their relationship with God placing their affections and loyalties on false gods, and inducing others to follow this manner of living. To drink of the wine of this sin implies internalizing Babylon's evil ways. Elder Bruce and McConkie, referring to the wine of the wrath of her fornication, said the wine of the wrath of God, the consequence of her fornication. As she made the, the nations drink of the wine of her fornication, so she herself shall be made drunk with the wine of God's wrath. The fall of Babylon shall occur after the restoration of the gospel in this dispensation. Because of the impending fall of Babylon in the last days, the Lord has warned the Latter-day Saints to go ye out from Babylon, meaning that we must flee the wickedness of the world. The third angel described the judgments to come upon those who worship the beast and receive his mark. Revelation 14.9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, they will receive God's punishing anger, described as drinking the wrath of God without mixture or without delusion. Other scriptures teach that God's wrath is poured out only when all other efforts fail to persuade men to repent. Revelation 14.10, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Elder Bruce and McConkie, referring to the wine of God, said, In the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and he poureth out of the same, but the dredges thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. And referring to the wrath of God, he said, Deity manifests wrath as one of his attributes. It is an accompaniment of anger. Indignation is its emotional basis. Inherent in it is the purpose and intent of meting out a just punishment upon those whose acts have caused it to be aroused. The wrath of God does not fall upon the righteous, but upon the wicked. Instead of blessings, ye by your own works bring cursings, wrath, indignation, and judgments upon your own heads. By your follies and by your abominations, which you practice before me, saith the Lord. When men are ripened in iniquity, then the fullness of the Lord's wrath comes upon them, and they are destroyed in the flesh. Such was the case with the Jaredites, the Nephites, and the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, for instance. Such will be the case with the wicked at the second coming. The fiery indignation of the wrath of God will continue to be poured out upon the wicked in hell until the day of their resurrection. Then, to all eternity, those subject to the second death shall be vessels of wrath, doomed to suffer the wrath of God with the devil and his angels in eternity.
and referring to poured out without mixture, he said, Wine was so commonly mixed with water that to mix wine is used in Greek for to pour out wine. This wine of God's wrath is undiluted. There is no drop of water to cool its heat. It is justice, not mercy, which the Lord will pour out upon the ungodly. The wrath of God shall be poured out upon the wicked without measure. Revelation 14.11 And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Elder Bruce and McConkie said eternal damnation, in the full and unlimited sense of the word, is meted out only to the sons of perdition. They are the ones who choose to worship the devil. They sell themselves to Satan with the full knowledge that the Lord is God, and beside him there is no Savior. To their torment there is no end. Also, those who do not obey the law of the gospel, and who therefore inherit a lesser place in the mansions that are prepared, shall suffer the fires of eternal torment in the sense of having eternal regret for lost opportunities. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Revelation 14.12 Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to they that keep the commandments of God, said, As the Lord lives, none else shall be saved. How can it be stated more plainly? It is not the grace of God standing alone. It is not confessing the Lord Jesus with our lips and stopping there. It is not mere belief. It is not church membership as such. It is not a position of prominence or dignity in the church. It is not any one or all of the thousand winds of doctrine that blow through the sectarian world. It is plain, simple obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Ye cannot be saved in your sins. And referring to the faith of Jesus said, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the identical truths which he believed, the way of life that he lived, nothing short of this will save any man. Revelation 14.13 And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Elder Bruce and McConkie, referring to a voice from heaven, yea, saith the Spirit, said, Gods and angels speak from heaven, words of eternal truth flow from their lips, and the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in the hearts of the saints echoes and re-echoes the endless verity of their divine words. And referring to the dead which die in the Lord, said, The saints of God, who have been true and faithful to every trust, who have kept the faith, who have endured to the end, who at their passing are prepared for an inheritance, in the paradise of peace, in that revealed passage universally known as the law of the mourner, the Lord says of them, Thou shalt live together in love, insomuch that thou shalt weep for the loss of them that die, and more especially for those that have not hope of a glorious resurrection. And it shall come to pass that those that die in me shall not taste of death, for it shall be sweet unto them. And referring to they rest from their labors, said, and then shall it come to pass that the spirits of those who are righteous are received into a state of happiness, which is called paradise, a state of rest, a state of peace, where they shall rest from all their troubles and from all care and sorrow. And referring to their works to follow them, he said, nothing else is ever taken by anyone when he departs this mortal sphere. That same spirit which doth possess your bodies at the time that ye go out of this life, that same spirit will have power to possess your body in that eternal world. Son of man harvests the earth. Elder Bruce and McConkie said, John now sees the harvest of the whole earth, both the righteous and the wicked. First, as recorded in verses 14 through 16, he sees the Son of man harvest his saints. Revelation 14, 14 through 15. And I looked and beheld a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to an angel, came out of the temple, said, Angelic ministrants from heaven itself. Revelation 14.16 And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to the earth was reaped, said, 
the harvest is sure. None of them that my Father hath given me shall be lost. Then, as recorded in verses 17 through 20, he sees the harvest havoc wrought among the wicked and ungodly when the vintage grapes are slashed from their vines with a sharp sickle and trampled in the winepress of the wrath of him whose vineyard they have desecrated. Revelation 14:17. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. Elder Brewster McConkie said, Angelic ministrants shall also have part in the destruction of the wicked at the second coming. For they that come shall burn them, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Revelation 14:18. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry unto him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to him that had the sharp sickle, said, The Son of Man, the Lord himself, who personally is to tread on the wine vat. John described two harvests in Revelation 14, 14 through 20, which are reminiscent of those described in the parable of the wheat and the tares. The first harvest gathers out the righteous from the wicked. This gathering began when the gospel was restored in the latter days and will continue into the millennium. President Russell M. Nelson said, One crucial element of this gathering is preparing a people who are able, ready, and worthy to receive the Lord when he comes again. A people who have already chosen Jesus Christ over this fallen world. A people who rejoice in their agency to live the higher, holier laws of Jesus Christ. Our duty is to raise up a generation of men and women worthy to receive the coming of the Lord. For he will come to Jackson County, Missouri to be sustained as King of Kings, and he will come also to to Israel to be hailed as Lord of Lords. Then his millennial reign will be ushered in. Why do I have a role in preparing the earth for the Savior's second coming? Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, because ours is the last and greatest of all dispensations, because all things will eventually culminate and be fulfilled in our era. There is, therefore, one particular very specific responsibility that falls to those of us in the church now that did not rest quite the same way on the shoulders of church members in any earlier time. Unlike the church in the days of Abraham or Moses, Isaiah or Ezekiel, or even in the New Testament days of James and John, we have a responsibility to prepare the church of the Lamb of God to receive the Lamb of God. In person, in triumphant glory, in his millennial role as Lord of Lords and King of Kings, no other dispensation ever had that duty. We have the responsibility as a church and as individual members of that church to be worthy to have Christ come to us, to be worthy to have him greet us, and to have him accept and receive and embrace us. The lives we present to him in that sacred hour must be worthy of him. The Israelites are to be gathered spiritually first and then physically. They are gathered spiritually as they join the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and make and keep sacred covenants. This spiritual gathering began during the time of the Prophet Joseph Smith and continues today all over the world. Converts of the Church are Israelites, either by blood or adoption. They belong to the family of Abraham and Jacob. The physical gathering of Israel means that the covenant people will be gathered home to the lands of their inheritance and shall be established in all their lands of promise. The tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh will be gathered to the Americas. The tribe of Judah will return to the city of Jerusalem and the area surrounding it. The lost ten tribes will receive from the tribe of Ephraim their promised blessings. Article of Faith 10. We believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the ten tribes, that Zion, the new Jerusalem, will be built upon the American continent, that Christ will reign personally upon the earth, and that the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisical glory. The second gathering represents God's judgments upon the wicked and the destruction that will come upon them when they, like grapes on the vine, are fully ripe in iniquity and are trodden in the winepress of the wrath of God. Revelation 14, 19-20 And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city. And blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. 
Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to the wine press, was trodden without the city, said, The great destructions of Armageddon shall take place outside the city of Jerusalem, in what Joel calls the Valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about, the Lord says. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the Valley of Decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the Valley of Decision. In the day of harvest it shall be said, Who is this that cometh down from God in heaven with dyed garments, yea, from the regions which are not known, clothed in his glorious apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? And he shall say, I am he who spake in righteousness, mighty to save. And the Lord shall be read in his apparel, and his garments like him that treadeth in the wine vat. And his voice shall be heard, I have trod in the winepress alone, and have brought judgment upon all people, and none were with me. And I have trampled them in my fury, and I did tread upon them in mine anger. And their blood have I sprinkled upon my garments, and stained all my raiment. For this was the day of vengeance, which was in my heart. And then in the day when all things are accomplished relative to the salvation of men, the angelic trumpet shall proclaim, It is finished, it is finished. The Lamb of God hath overcome and trodden the winepress alone, even the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. Indeed in that day the Son of Man himself, having delivered up the kingdom and presented it unto the Father, spotless, shall say, I have overcome and have trodden the winepress alone, even the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. Wine and Doctrine and Covenants 133, 48-51, as in the sacrament, suggests blood, both Christ's blood when he worked out the atonement alone, and the blood of vengeance on the wicked at the second coming. President Joseph Fielding Smith said that Isaiah had pictured this great day when the Lord shall come with his garments or apparel, red and glorious, to take vengeance on the ungodly. This will be a day of mourning to the wicked but a day of gladness to all who have kept his commandments. Do not let anyone think that this is merely figurative language. It is literal. And as surely as we live, that day of wrath will come when the cup of iniquity is full. We have received a great many warnings. The great day of the millennium will come in. The wicked will be consumed, and peace and righteousness will dwell upon all the face of the earth for one thousand years. 